how do you believe we can address those barriers? Well, I think there's a couple of things, and some of it's out of our control, and we're going to have to be pretty aggressive, I think, about lobbying to change some of the rules, right? Uh, the Public Utilities Commission right now isn't paying solar that gets put into the grid at a rate that it makes the math work for us to really go uh, fully into that strategy. We know that that's something that we need to work on. They're appointed by Dayton. We ought to be able to apply some pressure to make something happen there. Uh, but I think that that's something that, um, you know, that, that we've got to work on. And I think we're just going to see continued, continued, continued uh, uh, barriers from the state that we're just going to have to figure out how to overcome. And some of it's just going to take some real political will on our part. Um, to uh, figure out how to continue to build community solar, uh, continue to build up our access to renewables uh, in spite of a pretty hostile environment. Um, you know, that I think we're going to see. I think the other thing that we need to do is use the community partnership. One of the things that's really frustrating, if this is really a partnership and we've got Excel at the table, they are right now at the state lobbying against Minneapolis's values and interests, trying to get statewide policy passed that allows them to put more fossil fuels out there. And uh, we absolutely have to say, if you're going to be partners and you're taking $450 million of our money that's going out through you, uh, we'd like to see that not spent lobbying against the power that we're trying to build to get to a renewable energy future. So that's one of the ways that we can use the leverage that we have by getting them to the table, which Community Power had a big role in four years ago, um, to actually try to uh, take away some of the regulatory things that are blocking us from being able to have a working energy future. Thank you very much. And just to, to add on, energy partnership uh, that we have in Minneapolis between the city and then Excel and Centerpoint are our two large utilities that are tackling issues around how we reach um, some pretty ambitious clean energy goals. Um, so the next, uh, all right, Samantha. So the question, what are the barriers you currently see keeping Minneapolis from addressing climate change and achieving 100% renewable energy by 2030? And how do you believe we can address those barriers? Well, one of the largest barriers, unfortunately, is kind of what Steve touched on, is the unknown. Um, every day we hear about some of the program getting cut at the federal level. Um, and so every what, what hap what's going to happen now is we're going to have to be the most innovative that we've ever been before to really think outside the box on how we're going to get this work done. Because we're fighting it from the federal level, we're fighting it at the state level, we definitely need to do more lobbying. But we can definitely still be innovative on, on our own part within our city um, to think outside of the box and do something completely different. Um, and as far as the partnership is concerned, I find it really interesting that Excel Energy is the number one producer of wind energy in the whole U.S., um, but where is it? So how can we type it? How can we tap into that? How can we increase uh, more of it? Um, and looking towards that long-term goal of what does municipalization look like for us? Um, one of the things that we could potentially do um, because of some of our uh, federal and state um, constraints is we could look at purchasing some of those, um, some of that wind energy for ourselves from them. Um, because the problem with um, the studies with municipalization, everybody wants it, but the problem is we would have to then buy it, sell out. And we clearly don't have the money to do that um, necessarily. We'd have to buy out everything that they um, provide for us, basically. Um, it gets kind of complicated, but what we could do is buy some of that wind energy for ourselves. So that's something, you know, in the mindset of innovation that we can do um, to think about moving forward um, to bring more of that. But definitely, ultimately, we're going to have to hold people accountable. It's not a partnership if we're not partnering. And we're going to have to hold them accountable, period. Thank you. Uh, Corey, uh, what are the barriers you currently see keeping Minneapolis from addressing climate change and achieving 100% renewable energy by 2030? And how do you believe we can address those barriers? I think a major barrier we have
really the on-the-ground organizing um, that folks have done over the last several years that has really brought Excel to the table. They wouldn't be doing this had there not been um, concerted efforts, and we were early supporters of the Minneapolis Energy Options Initiative in 2013 that I think ultimately brought about um, the Clean Energy Partnership and brought Excel to the table. But we should also be really honest with the fact that Excel is still generating $200 million in profits every single year. And that fundamentally, unless we're confronting these sorts of things, both um, you know, in Minneapolis, I mean with MEO, they had to go outside of the boundaries of City Hall and do organizing, and I think it's important to note that that was, you know, again, one of the biggest initiatives that has resulted in steps forward. But that also, threats of preemption against minimum wage and other initiatives at the state level have been used across the country to roll back regulations around environmental steps forward, like in Colorado, um, the governor passed a preemption bill um, after taking a bunch of money from fracking companies that would uh, eliminate the opportunity for municipalities to do clean energy or clean water initiatives. In Oklahoma, of course, Scott Pruitt, who's now involved with the EPA, took forty thousand dollars from um, farmer polluting um, executives and then passed preemption at the state level to undo um, clean water initiatives there. So this is the type of thing we've just got to be very aware that not only is Excel going to be fighting this at the state level and could potentially team up with Republicans to pass preemption in a really serious way that prevents us from doing steps forward in Minneapolis, but that also it's the movements that have fundamentally moved the conversation forward and brought Excel um, you know, to the table. So the next question, we will go 40, and then Ginger, Samantha, and Steve. And the question is, Right now, utility energy programs provide rebates to people who can already afford thousands of dollars in upfront costs or can take out personal loans of several thousand dollars to make needed energy improvements to their homes. What would you change to ensure that everyone can participate in the clean energy economy? I would ensure that landlords as well as homeowners are eligible for this. some grants are only available to homeowners and not landlords. Um, so making sure that uh, those, those are accessible. Um, additionally, looking at whether there could be affordability built into that for if, if there are landlords who are doing improvements to homes, to uh, rental units, um, that they, once again, that they're able to qualify uh, for something to be able to keep the rents stable rather than passing energy improvement uh, onto their renters. in the city of Minneapolis to be able to push um, not just for the needs of people in our city, but um, to make sure that the city council has all the tools available to it to be able to solve an affordable housing problem that exists here, the question of people having the finances and, and access to the programs that can actually help them to you know, retrofit in a sustainable way. And so I would say you know, one thing that is actually really crucial is pushing on the state level to lift the ban on rent control to make it possible for us to put downward pressure on rents. And some of that is also having conversations with folks about, I mean, potentially implementing some kind of a millionaire's tax on the highest priced properties that exist in Minneapolis. That money could generate millions of dollars that could actually go toward social services in the city, which could also go toward helping with low interest loans, um, making them available to folks to be able to do these retrofits and not making it so that the upfront costs are totally insurmountable to working people in Minneapolis. And fundamentally, I think this is the type of vision we need to have in this moment when, you know, it's not just the Trump administration threatening people in an existential way, but this is about emboldening tenants to be able to speak in their own interests while at the same time not pricing working class homeowners out of the city of Minneapolis and making it a place that's completely unaffordable for most average people to live in. All right, uh, Samantha. Right now, uh, utility energy programs provide rebates to people who can already afford thousands of dollars in upfront costs or can take out personal loans of several thousand dollars to make needed energy improvements to their homes. What would you change to ensure that everyone can participate in the clean energy economy? Well, going back to the statistic that I said about 42% of the ward making, you know, under $35,000, the majority of those people are renters and pretty much 
much feel paralyzed because what can they do as the renter? They, they really have no say in anything that's happening in that home from insulation to solar panels to any of that. Um, so they, they really are crippled in a way. So Cordelia kind of touched on it, Cindy did too, about providing some sort of an incentive for those, um, um, for those landlords to be able to do these improvements so that way the, the renters benefit. But um, on that same note, talking about inclusive financing. Um, so that way you can you don't have to go into more debt to be able to provide um, these upgrades whether they're for yourselves as the homeowner or whether it's at, for the renters um, so that way it's on it's on your bill you're saving on your electric and at the same time you're um, you're paying on your solar um, so that's definitely something that I support and I would I would like to see get some movement but then also um, back to my point about talking about being innovative and some creativity um, creative district energy goals um, and looking at what that could potentially look like and they've done some really cool things in other areas I think it was in Vancouver where they were taking um, the uh, taking the dirty water essentially sewer water and using that water to heat up the clean water to then pump into homes um, and so that that was able to heat water and reduce costs there so there are some, there are some things that we can do outside of the box um, that we can implement that will really help. Um, in addition to, um, AMIL is a really good example of the hydrothermal that they use, and there, I think there's a way to do it without, uh, with the do no harm approach, as I call it, where you're not messing with river um, water levels, you're not messing with the waterfall, um, but you're still able to um, capitalize on that hydrothermal. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so right now, utility energy programs provide rebates to people who can only afford thousands of dollars and upfront costs or can take out personal loans of several thousand dollars to make needed energy improvements to their homes. Uh, what would you do to ensure that everyone can participate in the clean energy economy? So I think a couple of things. First, uh, I'm really excited about some of the creative ideas uh, that I actually learned about from Community Power uh, about figuring out ways to finance buying community solar um, on your utility bill in a way that's transferable so that renters can do it and can take it with them if they're moving from apartment to apartment. So you're buying into a community solar installation, but it's not necessarily on your roof, right? And so figuring out ways to make it so that as a renter you can make those choices. Um, the other thing is that there are subsidy programs for people in extremely low income, and they're not funded enough um, to help people with their utility bill. So we could actually connect that to buying into solar, uh, and we could actually, I think, expand that program and do quite a bit more to reduce the cost for everybody. Eventually, we want to see everybody getting the kinds of gains um, that you can get from buying into solar in terms of the long-term sustainability of it, the long-term cost efficiency of it. Um, and so I think I, I think those are really exciting programs. I'll just second what Cordelia said, but I think figuring out ways both to incentivize uh, landlords to make the repairs that they need to make uh, and also to sort of 